All right, it's just, uh, you guys can hear me, great. I just first of all uh, wanted to say I think it's really, really wonderful to see so many people here, especially on a Saturday afternoon and the sun is shining outside and you're all coming here to watch this. It's really, it's really nice. But, uh, but basically I wanted to say um, welcome. I'm guessing for a lot of you it's welcome to Lisbon. For some of you, welcome to the Champalimo, but for everybody here, welcome to the very first ever symposium of Occam's Beard. Now, now, what brings us here today, of course, is to celebrate the work of a man. Man, well, he died over 700 years ago, but before that, he was a very studious and ardent monk, and he was very concerned with uh, matters of philosophy, matters of reason, matters of truth. Most importantly, he had some very, very strong opinions about facial hair and what to do with it. Now, this, of course, is not on. <laughs> ah, wonderful. So this man, of course, was, uh, was William of Ockham. And uh, William of Ockham was studying many things about how to uh, actually explain the natural world around us. And he's, of course, the man who made famous the principle which we now know as Ockham's razor, or as I've been told it is in Portuguese, a navalha de Ockham, is that, is that more or less right? All right, so basically what he was studying, he was trying to study what to do if you have an unexplained phenomenon and there are multiple possible explanations. And what he posited was, uh, I hold off with here, my, my spoken Latin is not very good. It's a nunquam ponenda et plur, uh, plurala, pluralitas sina necitate. So basically, loosely translated in English, this means uh, plurality is never to be posited without necessity, but basically what it means is the simplest explanation is the most likely. Now this may not seem so obvious at first why this needs to be the case, but if you think about it, this is actually something which forms such a part of our daily lives that we barely even think about it. i uh, bring you through an example. You come home, you open the fridge, you want to take out the pizza which you had been saving for dinner and the pizza has disappeared. There are many things that you could be thinking. Kid, for, for example, maybe it grew little feet and ran away. Maybe it's still there, but it turned invisible. Maybe space aliens opened up a wormhole which happens to show up in your fridge and your pizza is now flying through outer space somewhere. Most likely it was that lazy housemate of yours who just <laughs> took it and ate it himself. And, and I mean, it just seems so, so, so logical that it almost seems not worthy of giving it a name or a principle. But of course, on a daily basis, it's got daily effects. But it's also a very important rule when it comes to applying science. And this is just going to be one example of science done right in one of the most elegant ways uh, using the principles of Occam's razor. So um, for a very long time throughout our history, we had a model that everything revolved around the Earth. Now, of course, it seems to make a lot of sense. That's what it looks like when you're standing here. Everything revolves around us. And um, what started to happen is after a while, they were able to trace the movements of planets. And as they started tracing movements of planets, they had to come up with a very complicated way to describe the orbit. So basically, the orbit was an egg-shaped thing, which once every few years did a little, little loop-de-loop -loop and went backwards in motion, described by an equation of circles nested within circles, nested within circles. And of course, uh, Copernicus came along, and he saved us all by coming up with a very much simpler model, saying everything revolves around the sun in a circle. And I mean, it's pretty much still a functional model today, so um, good for Copernicus. Uh, now, in the same way, of course, that um, Occam's razor is, is very useful in being able to create good science, there are also many instances in which you can imagine where if it's not applied properly, you end up with bad science. And Occam's razor is just one of many such principles which we think are important in being able to conduct good science. Uh, we actually went to go search for a list if there was any kind of criteria, things you should watch out for, couldn't find anything. We decided to come up with a list ourselves, and if you look um, under your seats, I believe, you'll all have a copy of this, uh, what we have called BS Bingo. Um, that's bullshit bingo for the adults, bad science bingo for the children among us. <laughs> and uh, what we tried to do is basically make a list of every single thing which can go wrong when you're trying to come up with a, um, a scientific experiment. It's by no means, of course, comprehensive and might change over time, but it's somewhere to start. And of course, just to make it a little bit of fun, we turned it into a bingo card. And the idea is that the next time, I don't know, you go to a seminar, you're reading a paper, you're reading the latest article about scientists have recently discovered that, possibly even for your own work, you can have a quick look at this chart. And uh, all of the terms are explained on the back. 
And if you start noticing that the work displays some of these symptoms, you might want to start thinking twice about the work that you're reading or the work that you're doing. And if you actually manage to get a bingo in any of these, it's probably a very good time to turn around and run away. And just to give you an example, so I mean, I would like to emphasize here that not all science is bad science. Pretty much all science, it's very good. And it goes through a very, very systematic process in which by the end result, everything that's written down is basically fully the truth as far as the authors know it. But as with anything else, mistakes are made. And I'm just going to take you through one of these historical examples where not just one mistake was made, but there were so many mistakes at every single level that the consequences of this are still running with us today. So this particular example, uh, this comes from the UK. I don't know how many of you have heard of it, but this was what started the entire link between vaccines and autism. So this man here, um, Dr. Andrew Wakefield, he, uh, he published a paper in which he said he thought it was likely that the vaccine against measles, mumps, and rubella could cause autism. The media picked this up and everything completely went crazy. The entire public response was very, very heavy. But if you look at what this is actually based on, the initial publication in 1998, there is practically zero evidence for this. All right, so I'm gonna quickly run through the story and uh, just for a matter of fun, there it is. All right, we're gonna take our little uh, 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 BS bingo and uh, keep it here. So basically what this guy um, uh, reported in this study, it was a study on a handful of children who had showed up in a hospital with irritable bowel syndrome. And he looked at these children they were all autistic, and a lot of them had just had, uh, had just had their shots against measles, mumps, and rubella. Now, of course, this was just a three-sentence phrase which he had written down in the paper, but immediately he already established this link between vaccines and autism. What he doesn't say is, if you look at the hospital, it's a children's hospital for children with behavioral disorders. The odds of finding kids with autism in there, it's already pretty high. Plus, these are all kids. All kids in the UK at that time are being vaccinated against MMR. So the odds of finding kids who are autistic with, who have just had a vaccine in a hospital like this, I mean, it's of course, it, it, you could hardly call it an unbiased sample. So that's, that's one loss over there. Um, and then of course, there was absolutely no mechanism for this. It was just simply based on an observation, equating a correlation of two things which co-occur together and saying that there was a logical cause between them. Now, of course, if you actually wanted to see if this was the case or not, the proper scientific thing to do would be to conduct a study where you have a group of kids who have had the vaccine and a group of kids who haven't had the vaccine, and you see if one of the two groups has more incidence of autism. But that didn't happen either, so there was absolutely no control. And then I think most importantly, is that, of course, bingo, if you're going to claim something as big as that you found a cause for autism, a very, very complicated disease, and then it lies in a vaccine, something which inherently saves lives, you better have some pretty good evidence other than just a hunch or one or two sentences. Now, other than these very fundamental problems, the entire story has so many holes in it, you could probably fill up this entire bingo card, but uh, I'll leave it up to you if you want to do that. But we were, we were, we were interested to see what kind of consequences can it have if you fail to apply the logical rules of science properly? And what we decided to do, which brings us right back to the beard, is ask you guys, ask Portugal. We requested you guys, we said, what happens if you take real scientific data, if you take real scientific methods, but you leave out possibly the sharpest tool in the scientific toolbox, Occam's razor, what kind of crazy hypotheses can you come up with? And you guys wrote in some really, really fun topics. And it was really, it was really fun to read. You're a very creative bunch. And that, of course, is what we're going to be doing today. And we're going to be seeing a series of presentations um, on some very uh, crazy hypotheses. But of course, other than the fact that it's going to be fun, we do take ourselves very seriously. So we do have a jury. And I'm quickly going to introduce you to the jury. So from left to right, there's uh, Dr. Marta Moita here from the Palimo. Uh, Elio Susena from the uh, uh, Gubenkin Institute, um, Professor Donathan Howard, Director of the Gubenkin Institute, and Dr. Zach Manin, Director of the CMP. And this elite team of scientists is going to be critically judging every single presentation that's coming for, what is it, scientific integrity and ridiculousness, I believe? <laughs> so what's the rest of the day going to look like? This is going to be the rest of the day. We're going to have eight talks. Unfortunately, one of our speakers couldn't make it. 
But we're going to have a series of seven talks. Each one will be about 10 minutes, followed by five minutes of questions from the jury. If we have any time left, we will try to take one or two questions from the audience. But we've got, where is Sasha running around with a microphone? Yes, there you are. So you're going to have to be quick. So if you've got a question prepared, try to signal uh, that guy over there. He will have a microphone, and he will try and come and try and uh, make sure you can get your question out. So um, I'm going to have a short interval so that people can uh, kind of refresh. You can get some drinks, get some food. And if we stick on schedule, which I have no idea if we will be able to do or not, the closing ceremony and, of course, the prize for the very best talk will be somewhere around 8 o'clock.